Hey everybody, my name is Elizabeth McSwan from Emac and Hedwig, and today's video is a How I Got the Shot story entitled The Timely Ptarmigan. So here we go. In September of 2018, I went on a trip a week-long trip to Glacier National Park and had a blast. If you've never been to Na Glacier National Park, it is really one of the crown jewels of a national park system. It's got these sweeping views of things like mountain ranges, glacial lakes, and just these really beautiful valleys. The hiking there is really great and you can see some really, really cool wildlife. If you saw my video about the Christmas barred owl, and I'll link the video in the description below if you want to check it out. I mentioned a friend of mine, a birder friend of mine in that video, and it was, and that same friend came with me on this trip to Glacier National Park. In total, there were about 14 of us that went. And our top bird that we wanted to see and hopefully photograph was the white-tailed ptarmigan. I've been saying ptarmigan this like whole time, but apparently it's ptarmigan. White-tailed ptarmigans are really cool birds because they live in an alpine environment that's very high altitude all year round. So while a lot of other animals, you know, in the winter time <clears throat> will come down to lower elevations where it's a little bit more temperate, the white-tailed ptarmigans will stay up there and hang out like all winter long. Their habitat is kind of more open areas. And so they tend to live kind of at or just above the tree lines in mountain environments. And so another way of saying that is when trees are like, it's a little bit too much up here, you know, we out, the ptarmigans are like, yeah, we're in. Seeing one is really, really tricky though. They blend into their environments really well in the winter time. They are pure white and really beautiful birds and they just sit in the snow and they're really hard to find. In the summertime or in sort of the non-winter months, they are kind of more brownish, the sort of mottled brown color. And because the, the rocks in, in, you know, in their environments are kind of different colors, that, that sort of mottled uh, pattern in their feathers can be really confusing and deceptive to potential predators and it can help you know, camouflage them. Some other cool facts about ptarmigans are that their young, like ducklings, are they're, when they're hatched from their shells and essentially their nests are just like a scrape on the ground, just like a little kind of bowl that the female will kind of, <clears throat> you know, gather stuff around debris and stuff to help, you know, create a little bit of a rim of a nest. But as soon as those babies hatch, within like, within a few hours, they're out of the nests and they're eating on their own. The best place to see ptarmigans in the park is a place called Logan Pass. And Logan Pass is along going to the Sun Road, which is the main road and I think the only road that connects East Glacier to West Glacier. And Logan Pass is the highest elevation of that, which makes sense that the ptarmigans would like it up there because they like those high, high elevations. So the very first day of our trip, and we started in East Glacier. We started in East Glacier and we were there for a few days and then we moved to West Glacier. And a little wrinkle in our trip was that going to the Sun Road was closed from Logan Pass to West Glacier because of really, really bad forest fires. There were some really bad forest fires last year. We could still get to our accommodations on that side, but instead of going through the park and you know driving this very, very scenic uh, route on going to the Sun Road, we had to kind of go all the way around and you know onto sort of more of like a highway which was still pretty but not nearly as pretty as going to the sun road but we didn't have any trouble on the east side so we we get up early on our first morning at glacier get up early we get into the van we have a couple of other friends with us my birding friend and i we drive to logan pass and we see a spectacular sunrise we see some wildlife we see some marmots and some ground squirrels and it's just, and of course, just the beauty of being up there. It's just breathtaking. There are these mountains with these valleys and glacial lakes. It's just beautiful, but no ptarmigan. We're only up there for a few hours when all of a sudden this weather system comes moving in. The temperature drops. I, for one, was nervous, especially with my camera gear, that we were gonna get caught in some torrential rainstorm because it really felt like that was coming. And thankfully it didn't really, but it was enough to get us off of 
off of the trail and back down towards the visitor center. And by the time we got down there, it was getting kind of crowded at the at the visitor center, and we just thought, you know what, like what like what bird is going to be out and about with all these people there walking along the trail? Like we're never going to find one. So we decided to go somewhere else, and we go and and make and do some other hikes. And we never really get back up to Logan Pass uh, during our time in East Glacier. We just never get back up there. We continue on with our trip and we make the journey over to West Glacier. And the days are ticking down of our trip and and I'm just thinking, are we gonna be able to get back up to Logan Pass? There was a lot kind of up in the air. And then something really, really amazing happened, which was the park had enough control over the fires so that they felt comfortable opening up their shuttle service. They have a free shuttle service to Logan Pass, I think from both sides of the of the park, East and West Glacier. And so they you could, so you could get up to Logan Pass pass from West Glacier using their shuttle service. But there were a lot of restrictions. The first one was that they were only letting up a certain number of people. And the second one was that you only had a certain amount of time that you could spend up there because when they gave you your t your ticket you got your departure time and also the shuttle that you had to get back and you could get on an earlier shuttle but you couldn't get on a later shuttle so people are leaving on sunday and this i think the first day that they did this was on saturday i think that was the first day the day before maybe friday but <clears throat> we decide on the day that people are leaving and have to like go onto a plane to go home, we decide that we are gonna try one more time, Hail Mary, we're gonna try to go for it and, and get on a shuttle to Logan Pass. So we get up at 6 a.m., we stand in line for a long time, it seemed anyway, and we get on the second shuttle. We don't even get on the first shuttle because this is a really popular thing for people to do. A lot of people are interested in getting to Logan Pass from the west side. So we get on our shuttle. And I have to say, the drive on going to the Sun Road from the east side to Logan Pass is very pretty, don't get me wrong. But from the west side, it is just like other level glorious. I mean, it's also a little treacherous. Like I'm kind of glad that I wasn't driving. I probably would have been fine, but it was just really, really, uh, like you're kind of on the side of a mountain and looking down like, oh, okay. Yeah, let's keep driving. But I would really, but in all seriousness, I would love, I would love a ch an opportunity at some point to drive that and, and turn off at all the little, all the little turnouts that you can just park and just enjoy the views because the views were just spectacular. So we get to the top, we get to the visitor center at Logan Pass and we, we start up the trail. Now the trail, I don't know how long the trail is there. I know that there are a few different ones. The one that we went on was sort of the main trail. And I don't know how far it goes, but we went, we only went down about a mile. And most of that trail on the part that we were on was uphill because you're kind of going up and up and up. And then you sort of reach a crest in the, in the mountain and then you kind of come back down, but it's all very flat. It's all very, it's like, it's not treacherous at all. It's really fairly moderate. We hike on the boardwalk trail and it's a lot of boardwalk because it's sort of, it's very rocky. And so they've, they've made this boardwalk for a lot of it, especially the, the, the rocky parts that are a little bit steeper. And we're hiking along and we see, despite the fact that now it's mid morning and there are a lot of people up on the mountain, there are a surprisingly amount, like large amount of wildlife. We had really good views of a marmot with her baby. We got to spend some time with a big group of bighorn sheep, which I've seen before in uh, Yellowstone a couple of years ago when we, when we did a trip to Yellowstone, but I'd never seen so many of them this close up. So that was really fun. And then the time comes, it's like, okay, we have to get back down the mountain. So it's me and my birding friend and then a couple of other, other friends. And our couple of other friends were, were way ahead of us. My friend and I are kind of trudging down, back down towards the visitor center and I'm kind of disappointed at this point. And then all of a sudden, right off of the boardwalk, I see this, what looked like a couple, and they were looking at something on this big flat rock that was right on the boardwalk. It was like practically touching, it was so close. 
and I look at what they're looking at and I just grab my friend and I'm like, hey, there's a bird on that rock. And he's like, oh my God. Every inch of self-restraint was necessary <laughs> to keep us from bum rushing that bird, right? Because we don't want to scare it, of course. So we're, we're kind of coming up to it, coming up to it, coming up to it. And it was kind of sitting like low, like, like kind of like a chicken would, you know, like kind of sitting on its legs. Let me show you a photo of it. This is not even in focus, but just for you to get a sense of what we were looking at. Okay, so this was the first shot that I took of this bird. And this shot is bad for a number of reasons, but the primary one, of course, is because, as you can see, it's really not that sharp at all. And uh, it was because there was all this foreground kind of vegetation in the front that really made it difficult uh, for my lens to focus on the bird, and kind of focus through it onto the bird. And this is how we saw the bird when we first came across it. And it wasn't long after we spotted it, and it was perhaps because of our excitement that it actually stood up and it dropped down onto the other side, the far side of this rock. And my heart just sank a little bit because I thought, did we kind of, did we blow our chance with this bird? But there must have been another ledge similar to the ledges that, as you can see here, the, there are these kind of tiers to the rock in the foreground here. And I think something was sim similar was happening on the other side uh, of, this, of this rock because we could see the bird as it moved left to right on the other side of this rock. And so... I decided that I was going to get into a much better position for when the bird, if it was going to stay on the trajectory that it was on, that I would be in a position to photograph it and photograph it well. So I'm just going to go over a few of my favorite shots from this series and show you the ones that I like and why I like them. And so as this bird was going across, it became more and more visible. I knelt down on my right knee. I used my left knee to prop up my left elbow because of course my left elbow was holding the lens. And I just used that to help me stabilize the camera. And this was the first shot that I was able to get of this bird after it got into a better position. And as you can see, much better light. It's much closer to me. And what I love about this particular location is the beautiful alpine flowers in the back here. And as you can see in the yellow, and I got a purple one over here. And it was just, I just couldn't believe my luck with this shot. I would have been happy with this, even though you can't see the whole bird. I just thought this was so beautiful. The light is a little bit strong, but there was really nothing that I could do about that. And there was a little bit of diffusion with the clouds. It, it paused here at this location, and I was able to get a few shots of it here. And then it completely cleared the rock. So it was, it was coming from over in this direction here, uh, moving to the right. And it eventually cleared this piece of rock entirely. And I was able to get this full body shot. Again, there's beautiful background separation here, which I love. And there was so much color, even in the rocks, and a little bit of you know vegetation to create this color blur. So it was really, really pretty. Something interesting also about this shot is that, that I love is that you really, and these shots in general, the series of shots that I was able to get is that you can see the feet of this bird really well. The, this bird has very unique feet, right? It has these really, really thick legs and big feet to help it in the winter time when it's cold, of course, and you know they need to be able to conserve energy and, um, and be able to keep warm, basically. So I thought that was really cool. And as I was researching for this video, I found out that, in fact, ptarmigans can have this kind of light-colored under, underside here, even in their summer plumage. But you can see that it's starting to transition here with all of these white feathers that are starting to grow in over the kind of mottled brown. And if you just look at the pattern in these feathers, it's just so pretty. I mean, it's just, it's beautiful. I just think it's, it's so beautiful. This is just the beginning of this bird turning um, completely white. I believe this is a female bird. Uh, a male would have, and it's not always visible, but have like a, a red eyebrow, even in the winter time, even in their white plumage, the sort of a little bit of a red eyebrow there, which I think is really cool. I just included in this series uh, this shot of it preening. I generally like to have the head and the eyes of the bird visible in the shots that I post, so I haven't posted this one. 
but again you get to see the beautiful detailing in the in the head feathers and these this beautiful these beautiful brown tones you have i have this kind of cool bokeh here which i'm not really sure how that happened but i thought it was cool and then again of course the colorful background and a little bit more of the alpine flowers most of these ones of the full body were cropped down I cropped them down just to get a little closer and also because I wasn't really sure when I was capturing these and when I was shooting what I wanted to include in these shots and what I didn't. It just happened so fast and it was really hard for me to, to think about much else other than photographing this bird, making sure that it's sharp, that I just wanted to give myself options. So I did end up, even though the focal length here says 400 and you know, three millimeters, this was, you know, probably cropped a good deal, probably a third of this image, if not a little bit more maybe, was cropped out. And this was another photo that I really liked. You get less flowers here. Because the bird is looking to the left, I like generally to have space in my image for the bird to, to look left and space for it to look into so it doesn't feel like it's looking up against sort of the edge of the edge of the frame. And so that means I'm having a little bit less flowers. I do get some here on the on the right side, but it becomes more, kind of more about the bird here. I really like how it's kind of leaning forward. I like the posture here. I like that you can see both feet. It's pretty awesome. So this one here, this was cropped a lot less. This was kind of more representative of the frame lines of my of, of all of these photos, all of these full body shots. And I basically did exactly the opposite of what I did for this last shot here in terms of the cropping. And I, I cropped allowing more space on the right here because I wanted to include some flowers. And to me, it doesn't really, it doesn't bother me as much in this frame, not having as much space on the left here. And the reason why was because the bird's body kind of feels like it's facing a little bit more right. Um, as opposed to this one where it really feels like it's facing to the left. It really feels like the gaze and the body language, the body positioning is really facing more left. And so <clears throat> I think that the left, leaving space in the left here makes sense as opposed to here where it feels like there's a little bit more weight kind of on this right foot. Um, and, or I guess the bird's left foot, and it just feels a little bit more balanced, this pose, and so I can get away with having a little bit more space here. And of course, adding some visual interest here and some environment also I feel like helps uh, with that. And I did a similar thing here where again, this bird, it really feels like it's facing to the right. So it feels like I could just, I could crop it this way and and leave more space on the right than the left. And one of the other reasons why I did that was because I just liked, I liked what was going on over here more than I liked what was going on over here. I mean, like, as, as you can see in this shot, it's basically just rock here, which isn't, you know, it's not terrible, but I really just love the, um, I really love the, the blur, the background blur and the flowers that are over here. So I really, when you're, when you're cropping your photo, you really have to think about what's best for your composition and not necessarily what you want to include in the frame and not include in the frame. And so people might have differing opinions on this crop, but for me, I feel like I was able to crop the way that I wanted to and have it feel kind of balanced and have it not feel like the bird is kind of on the edge of frame as much. So now this next one here, um, this is actually two different shots. The original head of, of the shot with the, with the raised foot, I really love the raised foot here. It's, you can really see the, the toes and it's just so cool. And so I really wanted to do something with this shot, but the real bummer was that the head wasn't sharp. So I took a head from another shot and I basically put it on top in Photoshop. I basically cut it out with plenty of room around it uh, in the background so that I could then, after it was placed in Photoshop, I could just go around with a very soft edged eraser brush and just erase the edges 
of the um, of the shot and make it really blend in really well. And I love the result here. I think it's just really beautiful. This, of course, is just more room to the left because I felt like it was just better to do it that way, to have there be more room here because it just feels like this bird is really, there's a lot of, I'd say, intention to the left here. So it really felt like cropping um, more on the right, off more of the right was sort of the right way to go here. And then this one was just kind of for fun. I, I, I didn't even get the head in focus here. <laughs> the head is completely out of focus. But it was just, this was the last shot that I got of this bird before it hopped off of this rock and joined its young. There was actually a family of these birds. And it, the, there were a couple of babies and, may, and I think another adult. And I would have loved to get the babies in this shot, in, in this series of shots. But they were really far below me. I wouldn't have been able to get eye level with them. And the light just wasn't great. It just the situation for those for the babies was really not great in terms of photography. This bird, this adult bird was much better. And this bird was just giving me such great looks and such great poses and it was coming towards me this whole time from you know from this shot to this shot or this shot. Uh it was coming towards me the whole time. So that was also really fun that it was even though I was there that it was still kind of doing its thing and and uh, and minding you know minding its babies and and eventually joined its family and hopped off of this rock. Something to note, especially in glacier, is that whenever you're photographing something or you even if you have your binoculars up to your face, just kind of scanning and looking, people will ask you what you're photographing or what you're looking at. And if you are actively photographing something, like if there, if there is, if it is obvious that you are looking at something and actively shooting, it's really easy to cause a wildlife jam. People want to know what you're looking at. They want to see it. And so it really didn't take long for us to get a really big <laughs> wildlife jam on the boardwalk with people stopping and looking at, at this bird. And some people didn't even care and they just kept on going. And I just think, how can you not care about this bird? It's such a cool bird. It's like ptarmigan this, ptarmigan that, like all over the visitors, visitor center. And it's like, oh, bird, whatever. Oh man, these birds are just so cool. This session lasted like, I, I wanna say like less than five minutes. I mean, it was pretty quick. We could have, you know, bounced to the moon. We were so excited. We were so excited to get, not only to see this bird, but to have the best circumstances in order to photograph and get good photographs. I could have not asked for more than what this bird gave us. It was, it was amazing. And it just really makes me think about like any time that I have these types of encounters that it's really so many things have to come together in order for in order for me to be at the right place at the right time to get this these beautiful creatures and to capture them in what i think are really beautiful pictures and it is just it's these moments that just it makes all of the other times where you go out and can't find anything to photograph really just worth it and I couldn't be happier with that experience. It definitely made my top five wildlife encounters of 2018. So that's my story. So now we're booking it down to the to the shuttle, not because we're late for the shuttle, but because my friends have, they all have a flight to catch. We were gonna go on the earlier shuttle anyway, and I think we did make an earlier shuttle, but I, I think that they really, they caught their flights at the airport by like the skin of their teeth. I mean, it was really, it was cutting it really close. And I had a headwig when I was driving home from Glacier. So for me, it wasn't really a big deal, but for them, it was a big, it was a pretty big deal, but they did make their flights. That's my ptarmigan story, everybody. I hope you enjoyed listening to it. I really enjoy telling these stories. I'm gonna be doing more of these types of, of videos. And I'm new around YouTube. If you really like this content, I would really appreciate your support. Whether you wanna like, share, subscribe, you know what to do. You can also find me on Patreon. I'll link the website in the description below. And until the next video, everybody, have a, have a great day. Happy adventuring, happy shooting. See you later, bye.